Welcome to our lecture on investigating proteins. Within this series of lectures, we will discuss common techniques used by biochemists to study protein characteristics, structure, and function. The key topics that we'll cover are protein purification, protein identification and visualization, protein synthesis and sequencing, and protein structure elucidation, as well as proteome analysis. To begin with, we will first look at how proteins are purified from cellular mixtures so that they can be individually studied. The methods of protein purification are chosen and used depending on the need of the purification. For example, whether you need a lot of protein of interest or only a small amount. Preparative purifications aim to produce a relatively large quantity of purified proteins for subsequent use. Examples include preparation of commercial products such as enzymes like lactase or nutritional proteins such as soy protein isolate and certain biopharmaceuticals like insulin. High amounts of protein are often also required for structural analysis of the protein. Analytical purification produces a relatively small amount of protein for a variety of research or analytical purposes including identification, quantification, and studies of the protein's post-translational modifications and function. Some analytical purification can also be used for protein structural analysis depending on the technique used. Any protein purification scheme needs to use techniques of separation. How do you purify proteins from complex mixtures? First, Let's think about what protein features and characteristics can be used that will allow differential separation. Proteins differ in the fundamental areas of size, charge, and affinity. Thus, these characteristics are exploited when developing purification schemes. The exploitation of these characteristics of protein differences has given rise to four main protein separation techniques for the large-scale preparation of proteins. These are precipitation and differential solubilization, dialysis, centrifugation, and chromatography, with chromatography being the most varied of these techniques. We will take a closer look at all of these techniques. But first, they must all begin with extraction, as proteins are housed within cells that make up more complex tissues. As we saw in Chapter 1, cells are complex places made up of all four macromolecules, lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. To purify proteins, the first step must be to isolate the protein fraction of the cellular components away from all of the other components. This can be done by first breaking the cell open. To break the cell, you can use freeze-thawing cycles, sonication or the use of sound waves to shatter the plasma membrane and or the cell wall structure, use of high pressure, grinding, or detergents. During this process, proteases are normally contained in specialized compartments within the cells and they will be released. So it's very important to inactivate the proteases within the extract and to keep the mixture cold to help preserve the shape and biological activity of the proteins. Now we can move on to discuss large-scale protein separation techniques. The first one involves protein precipitation and differential solubilization. In bulk protein purification, a common first step to isolate proteins is precipitation using a salt such as ammonium sulfate. This process is called salting in or salting out. This is performed by adding increasing amounts of ammonium sulfate and collecting the different fractions of precipitated proteins. Ammonium sulfate is often used as it's highly soluble in water and has relative freedom from temperature effects and typically is not harmful to most proteins. So depending on your protein's characteristics, you might have your proteins precipitate out in this first fraction with relatively low salt concentration, or at a mid-range, or at a high level of solute. Once the proteins have been partially purified by salting in and out, 
the salt must be removed from the solution to help avoid altering the biological function of the protein by disrupting normal intermolecular interactions. This can be done by dialysis. The process of dialysis separates dissolved molecules by their size. The biological sample is placed inside a closed membrane where the protein of interest is too large to pass out of the pores of the membrane, but through which smaller ions can easily pass, shown in green. As the solution comes to equilibrium, the ions become evenly distributed throughout the solution, while the protein remains in the dialysis tubing. This reduces the overall salt concentration within the suspension. Centrifugation is a process that uses centrifugal force to separate mixtures of particles of varying masses or densities that are suspended in a liquid. When a vessel, typically a tube or a bottle, containing a mixture of proteins or other particulate matter, such as bacterial cells, is rotated at high speeds, the inertia of each particle yields a force in the direction of the particle's velocity that is proportional to its mass. The tendency of a given particle to move through the liquid because of this force is offset by the resistance of the liquid that is being exerted on the particle. The net effect of spinning the sample in the centrifuge is that massive, small, and dense particles move outward faster than the less massive particles or particles with more drag in the liquid. When suspensions of particles are spun in the centrifuge, a pellet may form at the bottom of the vessel that's enriched for most of the massive particles. Non-compacted particles remain mostly in the liquid called supernatant and can be removed from the vessel, thereby separating the supernatant from the pellet. This is especially useful for protein purification as proteins will tend to remain in the supernatant fraction, whereas plasma membrane components and DNA which are much larger molecules, will collect within the pellet. A more specialized centrifugation technique is known as density gradient centrifugation. In this technique, a solute that won't damage the cellular components is used to create a layered density gradient during the centrifugation. Sucrose or other proprietary solutes such as percol are commonly used for this purpose. A protein sample is then layered on the top of the gradient and spun at high speeds in an ultra centrifuge. This causes the heavy macromolecules to migrate towards the bottom of the tube faster than the light materials. A properly designed sucrose gradient will counteract the increasing centrifugal force so the particles move in close proportion to the time that they've been in the centrifugal field. Samples separated by these gradients are referred to as rate zonal centrifugations. After separating the protein particles, the gradient is then fractionated and collected. This can be done easily by putting a pinhole in the bottom of the plastic centrifuge tube and collecting the fractions as they drip out from the bottom. Methods of chromatography are also commonly used to separate complex mixtures of proteins. These methodologies are often employed as a second step in purification pathways after salting out or the centrifugal step. Column chromatography can be used to separate larger quantities of proteins and can use the properties of charge, size, and affinity depending on the column matrix that's used. There are four main types that you should become familiar with. Size exclusion, ion exchange, hydrophobic interaction, and affinity. If your protein sequence is not known and only the biological activity has been identified, column chromatography is an experimental way to mediate separation. After each step, fractions must be collected and tested to identify where your protein has eluded. Positive fractions can then be pooled together and analyzed further for purity. Additional purification steps may then be required to reach the desired protein purity. The first type of column matrix that we'll discuss allows the separation of proteins based on their size. 
This is known as size exclusion chromatography or gel filtration chromatography. This technique involves the use of beads that have very tiny tunnels in them that each have a precise size. The size is referred to as the exclusion limit. Molecules with sizes larger than the exclusion limit do not enter the tunnels within the beads and pass through the column relatively quickly by making their way around the beads. Smaller molecules can enter the tunnels, do so, and thus have longer pathways to make it through the column. And they'll take longer to elute from the column. So you can see the large molecules elute first, and the smaller molecules are going to elute later. The next system is hydrophobic interaction chromatography, or HIC. HIC media is amphipathic with both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions, allowing for separation of proteins based on their surface hydrophobicity. The column matrix shown in blue has a hydrophobic ligand that's covalently attached. In high salt concentrations, proteins will bind to the matrix with differing affinity with more hydrophobic proteins, shown in yellow, binding more tightly than the hydrophilic proteins, shown in green. When the salt concentration is decreased, proteins that are more hydrophilic will be released first, following by more hydrophobic proteins. Ion exchange chromatography separates compounds according to their nature and degree of their ionic charge. The column to be used is selected according to its type and strength of charge. Anion exchange resins have a positive charge and are used to retain and separate negatively charged compounds, or anions, while cation exchange resins have a negative charge and are used to separate positively charged molecules, or the cations. The diagram above shows a cation exchange column. Within this system, the beads, shown in blue, have negatively charged particles attached to them, shown in red. The column is then washed with a solution of sodium chloride. The positive sodium ions will stick to the negatively charged groups that are attached to the bead. The protein solution is then applied to the column, and positively charged amino acids will stick to the beads and displace the sodium ions. This is the exchange part of the process. Once attached, the column is rinsed to wash away all of the other proteins that are not bound. The positively charged proteins can then be eluded from the column by increasing the concentration of sodium chloride in the solution. The sodium will then exchange with the proteins on the bead and release the proteins into the eluate. Anion exchange columns would do the opposite they would attract negatively charged proteins. If you know the protein charge, you can choose the best ion exchange method. However, if you don't know the charge of your protein of interest, all material coming off the column should be collected as fractions and then tested. For example, if your protein is neutral, it will come out of the column in the first column wash and won't stick to the column. So it's important to collect everything that comes off the column to find out where your protein elutes. Affinity chromatography is useful if you know that your protein of interest binds with a specific small molecule or ligand. For example, if you know your protein binds with glucose, you could use a column matrix that has been coated with glucose molecules. Usually, the small molecule or ligand is cross-linked covalently to the bead. Your protein of interest would then bind specifically with the ligand that's attached to the beads, while other proteins would pass through. Free glucose could then be added to the column to compete for the protein binding, causing it to elute. Affinity chromatography can yield high protein purification in a single step. However, some proteins may bind so tightly to their ligand that they cannot effectively be eluted once they have bound to the affinity column. So this has to be explored experimentally as well. A special type of affinity chromatography is immunoaffinity chromatography. This technique uses the specific binding of an antibody with its antigen. An antigen is a target molecule that the antibody will bind with selectively 
to purify the protein of interest. The procedure involves immobilizing an antibody to a solid substrate or the beads in the column, which then selectively bind to the target molecule, or protein in this case, while everything else will flow through. The antibody can be attached to the column matrix before the proteins are added, or they can be added after they have bound to the protein of interest. Either way can be an effective way to purify your protein. Antibodies typically will bind a protein very tightly, so immunoaffinity chromatography is often used to just look at the protein or analyze where it's been. You might run an SDS page gel afterwards to visualize the protein. That way you can denature the proteins and collect them as they unfold and come out of the tube. We'll discuss gel techniques for visualizing proteins in the next section. The matrices we've talked about thus far for size exclusion, HIC chromatography, ion exchange, and affinity chromatography can be used in different types of columns. The simplest are gravity-fed columns, where the solutions are loaded onto the column matrix and allowed to flow through and the fractions collected. The resolution of gravity-fed columns is often quite low and you will likely get a diffuse band that isn't separated well from other molecules that have similar characteristics. However, large quantities of extract can often be used in this type of column, and it might be a great first or second step in the purification scheme. High-performance liquid chromatography, or high-pressure liquid chromatography, HPLC, is a form of chromatography that applies high pressure to drive the solutes through the column faster. This means that diffusion is limited and the resolution is improved. The most common form is reversed phased HPLC where the column material is hydrophobic, but other types of resins can be used as well. The high pressure system, however, can often lead to the denaturation of proteins and is a drawback for HPLC protein purification. To help remedy this, fast protein liquid chromatography, or FPLC as shown here, uses low pressure with an aqueous buffer solution. This technique will often increase protein resolution and better separation than the gravity fed columns without causing denaturation that's seen with the HPLC. The setup for both HPLC and FPLC is very similar. The system shown here is an FPLC system. The column used is closed and it's attached with a pump. The pump is used to force the liquid under pressure through the column. Fractions can then be collected. The sample is added through the sample loop or an injection valve. So you can have your sample in a syringe and then you can enter it into the sample loop and it will flow onto the column. A common detection system is spectrophotometry using UV and visible spectrum absorbance. Conductivity could also be a measure. The FPLC columns can be glass and look very similar to the gravity fed columns. This is because low pressure is only used for these systems. HPLC columns are typically steel and they can withstand much higher pressure. During the purification of an unknown protein, it's necessary to have a quantitative system to determine how much protein has been purified, what concentration the protein represents from the original mixture, how biologically active is the purified protein, and the overall purity of the protein. This will help guide and optimize the purification method being developed. Note that this is a very experimental process and that researchers need to try different types of protein purification strategies to optimize their protocol. A good evaluation scheme will take into account the total protein, total activity, specific activity, yield, and the purification level. So pretend that you're a researcher that wants to isolate a novel, unknown protein from a bacterial culture. You grow 500 mils of the bacteria overnight at 37 degrees and then harvest the bacteria by centrifugation. You remove the culture broth and retain the bacterial pellet. 
You then lyse the bacteria by freeze thawing in 10 mils of your reaction buffer. Then you centrifuge the lysed bacteria to remove the insoluble material and retain the supernatant that contains the soluble proteins. Your protein of interest for this experiment has a biological activity that you can measure using a simple assay that causes a color change in the reaction mixture. That's shown here. You also note that this reaction rate increases with increasing concentrations of your protein supernatant. This biological assay can then be used to help you purify the protein responsible for this activity. At this point, you can try different types of purification methods. The first step is going to measure the baseline concentrations for the first purification level. In this case, the bacterial cell lysis and removal of insoluble proteins and other cellular debris by centrifugation. The total protein is calculated by measuring the concentration in a fraction of your sample and then multiplying it by the total volume of your sample. For example, if you're starting with 10 mils of supernatant, in a typical assay to measure protein concentration, you will only need to use 50 to 200 microliters of that sample to determine the full protein concentration. So if you calculated that there's 7.5 micrograms per microliter in your initial assay, you would need to convert that value into milligrams per milliliter and multiply it by 10 mils for a total of 75 milligrams of protein in the 10 mils of supernatant. This is your total protein. As you go through your purification scheme, you can see that the total protein will go down. This is because you're purifying your protein of interest away from the other proteins in the lysate. So you'll lose the other proteins at each step and hopefully retain your protein within the lysate. Total activity also goes down with each purification step. This is because some of your protein of interest is also lost at each purification step. For example, some of your protein will stick to the test tubes and glassware. Some protein won't bind with 100% efficiency to your column matrix. Some protein may bind too tightly and can't be removed from the column matrix during elution. And some protein may be denatured or degraded during the purification process. Total activity will be measured in the biological activity assay that is specific for your protein of interest and is usually presented in units where one unit, a micromole per minute, is defined as the amount of enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of one micromole of substrate per minute under the specified conditions of the assay method. The amount of your protein of interest that is lost at each purification step is represented within the overall percent yield. The percent yield is calculated using the total activity. For example, the percent yield in the first step is 100% of your protein sample. And in this case, the total activity is 25,000 units. The percent yield in step two is 93.7%. This was calculated by dividing the total activity for step two, 23,416 units, by the total activity in step one, and then multiplied by 100. Each subsequent total activity from further purification steps will then be evaluated against the total activity in the first step to calculate the percent yield. If the percent yield is too low, Alternative purification methods should be explored. The specific activity units are measured by dividing the total activity by the total protein. So specific activity should go up at each purification step. Your protein of interest should make up a greater percent of the total protein in the lysate after each purification. Finally, the purification level evaluates the purity of the protein of interest by dividing the specific activity at each purification step by the specific activity of the first purification step. Thus, the first step will always have a value of one. Overall, the fold increase in purification level 
should increase exponentially during the purification process. The fold purification that you wish to achieve will vary depending on what you intend to use your protein for. For example, how pure do you need it? If it will be used in medicine, you might need very high purity of your sample. It will also vary depending on how concentrated your protein of interest was in the sample. For example, if your protein of interest only makes up 0.1% of the lysate, you will need more purification steps to achieve greater purity than in a sample where 10% of your lysate is your protein of interest. In the next section, we will explore techniques for protein visualization and identification. They are often combined with and used during the protein purification processes as well.